Hello, and welcome back. We've come back from a rather short break. We're going to be descending into our second game of the day, which is going to be, I believe, Invulnerables Lotus versus Viperio. What do I know about these teams? I know about Invulnerables. They played in Division 3 last split. I know that I think we went 1-1 one one against them. That's my org that I own. What do I know about Viperio? I haven't seen Viperio in Yonks. The last time I saw Viperio was when they played in UKLC. Do you remember when that was a thing? That vestible, vestute, vestute uh, in institution of UK League of Legends, directly yeah. below Telia Masters, where all of our UK teams never ended up being quite as good as any of the teams from like Denmark or, or Sweden. Sad times. I remember Hedon used to play. Hedon used to play in the UKLC. Actually, it's another, yeah. another new new player. Yeah, it looks like uh, draft started and we see Talia ban first. That's pretty off putting. I think that's not normal here. But yeah, Talia ban, Rengar ban. And we see. I think Rengar ban is also. I think we are kind of seeing a lot of target bans. I assume we have like a Rengar one trick and we have like a Talia one trick on either side. Looks like. Uh... Well, I think. From what I remember, is it one of the Viperio players is a Rengar player, I think. If it, if one of them is, I would imagine I don't, that the only person I don't really yeah, know. Yeah, Sajunga, Sajunga. Yeah, I Mutra. I don't really know if he's a Rengar player, but if he yeah, is, yeah, I remember is, uh... when, we, when I did my illustrious uh, sort of tier list that was completely 100% objectively correct. True. Um, one of our players, one of the people we're talking about, is, was a Rengar one trick, which I don't like to use as a phrase because it never ends up being really true, but. At least he seems to be a heavily favoured Rengar player. I mean, if, if this is the same guy, yeah, we'll if have you're, to wait for someone in chat to confirm. Yeah, I mean, if you're so good at Rengar that you draw bans on it, then, I mean, all good for you. Because you just make it so that the enemy team has one less ban on middle champion. So that's just a positive for Viperio, I would seem. But, I mean, this is a do-or-die game for Viperio and Invulnerable. So it's time to pull out all the stops if you want to make it out of this group it's time to show up otherwise you will not be able to get out of this group now well you know it's not quite over i think you know whoever wins this whoever loses this definitely in a, in a bad spot i think it's fair to say yeah, anyway, yeah. Win, win this and you definitely can move to why is the draft disappeared oh draft this hello Draft, draft has unfortunately stopped. Uh, there's been a bit of an issue, apparently. We'll have to wait and see what the update is in terms of what we can bring you. Um, live from the scene, our producer is obviously in the lobby. Might be able to tell you what's happened. Um, one thing you'll always note about players um, in sort of leagues like this, not very good at basic menial tasks. They can be quite good in-game, have some skills, but when it comes to, like, you know, turning up on time, locking in champions not having your monitor go into energy saving mode and turn off you know stuff like this a bit more difficult than right clicking apparently yeah i think uh should get the draft up and running soon again but yeah i mean uh, it's definitely interesting to see if uh, either team can make a stand a big standing point on the next future games they're gonna play because the team who wins should be able to or should try to win in a dominating fashion so that when they go into next games they will go into into them with good momentum uh yeah i mean it's going to be tough i think they would have to win more that they will have to win the rest of the games as well if they want to have a good shot at getting out because obviously we have two teams on two one and two teams on one two so here we have the two teams on one two, and we want to see. The thing is, if they won two, then they two one, and if they two one, then they can one. They they'd have won two. This is the sort of thing. If you get one. Yeah, point. they can. They if they win two games, they can aim for a tiebreaker potentially. But yeah. uh, they definitely need to start off with a win here because the team. If they won, if they won two, they can run through, and then they won't be one two. They'll be two one. That's true. That's true. <laughs> See this All draft right. stuff again. Let's see if we see another Talia ban, maybe. <laughs> or maybe they. Oh, yeah. I just, just wanted to put this out there. I don't know how you feel about this. This is completely disconnected from anything that sort of has any semblance of no significance within the game. Both of these teams' logos look like Pokemon badges that you'd like win at a gym. Do you not think that's, so? That is true, actually. But I feel yeah, like Viperio is the badge you win from, like, I don't know, <laughs> some like. Like rock based gym, maybe like a red rock gym, and then Invulnerables is very much like a you know, when you go to those cities in Pokemon that have like all the water fountains, that's the kind of city that's the kind of that's the kind of gym you'd get it from. I can see it, 
But speaking Ooh. of uh, speaking of gyms from two guys who don't go to the gym, uh, we're into the draft now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, definitely every single meta champ is open, and we see the snap grave slug for Mutra, I would imagine. So it definitely looks like they're putting a lot of eggs onto the Mutra basket. And they're gonna try to see if he can pull off a big carry performance on the scrapes. And then we see the instant Maokai, Maokai response, which I think is one of the best champions on this patch, with alongside with the misfortune. So I mean, currently it seems like we have like the late game powerhouses being built up with now Seraphine as well. So it definitely could look like a long one we're coming into here. Definitely seems to be the case. Get that graze. It's a champion we see a lot more of these days, isn't it? Um, sort of these Hecarim's graves, a lot more kind of full clearing, playing aggressively, stuff like this. I mean, as a champion, I started to see a lot more just in solo queue because I remember when Zib came over, just absolutely decimating everyone with his heavy kind of a black cleaver, gore drinker, frozen heart build that he was just doing and absolutely decimating everyone with on that EU est. Um, but now the meta is even more shifted. I think pe more people have become wise to that. There's been, there's been some buffs, slight changes in the jungle, which means stuff like that comes out a lot more. And this Maokai, which you've just mentioned, but also mentioned at the beginning of the day as being a champion, you would have liked to have seen how the priority shifts. Uh, could be going jungle, could be going top lane as well, could be going support as well. It's kind of a triple flex in that way. Yep. And I already really, I do love to see Elmin on Rakan. The only thing that I think is dangerous by this early Rakan lock is that the instant response of a Silas is looking very dangerous. The Silas, if he takes over, he has the, some of the best ults in the game to pick from. A Rakan ult, a Seraphine ult, it's looking like he's going to be having a good time with these ults in the game. Indeed, he's definitely got, yeah, like you're saying, a lot to choose from. If we just look at this second ban phase, you see some of the top lane picks getting taken away from Champ. And I look at Champ and I think he played, he's played with energy before the player we just saw. I think they were on a roster yeah. a few years back. I think he's also played with Scood. I remember his name being on like a, maybe an Absolved roster. He's definitely a player I've seen around the kind of TESD kind of um, that era of uh, Danish League of Legends, which uh, yeah. kind of. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those players who sort of played like slightly below Telia, made it to Telia maybe once or twice, but kind of of that ilk. Il Ermin, obviously a player like that as well, someone who I've seen for multiple, multiple years. Mikkel, actually, strangely enough, um, not to bring any sort of personal bias on the cast, because I won't do that, obviously, because I'm a professional, the consummate professional, the Travis Bickle of, um, of League of Legends casting, but I've known Mikkel for years. I knew Mikkel three years ago. He was a low master, 300, 400 LP, 80 carry. He suddenly, for some reason, call it the season, Call it inflation, call it the economic market, it's somehow boomed up to 800 and it's playing competitive. But he, that, him and Ermin have known each other for a while, so I'd assume they have, although he's not played too much competitive, I'd assume they'd have, they'll, have, they'll have duoed quite a lot, had that kind of synergy that you get from playing with someone over the course of multiple years. So I'm interested to see how they stack up against Lona and Marcuse. I think that will be a real focal point for this game, at least for me. Yeah, that's going to be very interesting and we will keep an eye on that. I think it, one thing that's interesting to keep a note of is they locked in the Jacks, and I'm not sure they locked in the Aurelia. I think they did. So that's some very skirmish heavy champions to pick out now and they're going to look to fight. So we are going to see a Seraphine Rakan bot lane into a what looks like Maokai support potentially with this Malphite hover. Yeah, it's Maokai and Emeth bot against Seraphine and Rakan bot. So this matchup is gonna look very much towards Rakan just getting out of lane, getting on these roam timers and Seraphine just being able to stay in lane alone and just wave clear 1v2, as we have seen, we saw yeah. G2 do yesterday. Unfortunately, I have kind of highlighted the bot lane matchup as being exciting for the side of Hyperia because it's uh, Mikkel and Ermin, but they're playing, unfortunately, Seraphine and Rakan, which I can't imagine being too interesting. Yeah, this lane is basically just leave Seraphine on an island, Rakan go do stuff, and then hopefully the let's let's set our let's set our sights and expectations somewhere else. Then, if I talk about this mid lane matchup, for example, is that something that strikes out to you? Yeah, this mid lane matchup is gonna be extremely spicy. This is like the kind of matchup where the jungler who moves towards this lane can have a massive impact. So both these champions want to trade, they want to fight all day long. So whichever support can roam first, whichever jungler moves first, is going to make a huge difference to who gets a lead and whoever gets the lead can snowball the lead extremely effectively with these champions. I think that's completely fair. We'll have to see how that ends up transpiring. At least for now. We'll yeah. 
Sorry, you I, gonna say something? Yeah, I think it's also gonna be interesting to see if this Jax can take over the side lane. I think that's the focal point of this game is gonna be to see that if the Vipero side can actually have a 1v1 one one going because they have both a Jax and they have an Irelia. Both of these champions love to play side lane and they love to just be out there and being a menace. So I'm interested to see how they're going to be playing out the map in the later stages of the game. If they're going to be able to set up this 1v1 one one, or if they're going to be able to maybe play a 4-1 depending on how the lanes go. I think it should just go back to a kind of a Man City style, just playing with that holding midfielder, you know, back like when... <laughs> Back when Vincent Company was playing in the early 2015s, you know, just play kind of 4-4-2, defensive holding, keep it on passive, pass it around the box, get that wide distribution out, and I think they're golden. You're right. <laughs> does, the, does the beard get more than this? What, what, what kind of level of growth are we at, at the moment? Like, is this is this three weeks, a month? Is this, uh, about, is this, the, is this the peak? It's... This is uh, a lot of uh, years of work, <laughs> so it's gonna be really? take, yeah. So let's get, get some get some plant fertilizer on that, mate. Yeah, uh, probably, probably. This I is, mean, it's. I was about to show, it, I was about to show mine off. We are actually gonna be heading into the black screen of doom of death. Oh. About twenty seconds in now. Have a break. Have a Kit Kat, guys. Do remember, it's very important. Are you a fan of Kit Kats, Mister Flipper? I think Kit Kats are amazing. You strike me as the kind of guy that like doesn't obey the rules of Kit Kats. Do you like eat them one by one, or do you like take chomps out of the side or the top? Oh, I eat them. I take them and I crack them off one by one. Okay, so that, to me, that's like the ultimate question. I think instead of asking, you know, like when you're getting to know a girl or whatever, or you're getting to know a guy, who never knows, I don't judge. Um, one of the main things that you have to do is you sort of ask these questions, you know, you kind of play that small talk, get to know the other person. I think that should always be one of your first questions you ask someone, because I think you can tell a lot about someone from what, and hang on, I've just noticed, Mikkel is playing jungle this game. Wait, hold up. Wait, so I thought he yeah, was there. Yeah, they, no, they, yeah, they've roll swapped. He's playing jungle. Okay. Maybe that's a guy. That's a guy. That's a guy that doesn't eat Kit Kats normally. One hundred percent. He's gone against trend. Did they forget to swap, or was this planned? Do you think? I think planned. I think it'd be very strange if they, you know, didn't swap, and this has ended up being what happened. Mutra's obviously come forward on this seraphine, potentially proficient. Mikkel wants to play the jungle role. It yeah, I mean, it have... also it also makes a lot of sense that what you said about. Ermin and Mikkel having good synergy, so putting Mikkel in the jungle, and then if he has good synergy with Ermin, then they can link up a lot and they can impact this mid lane a lot together. And they 100%. can just roam around and try to make this work now. Yeah, you're keeping that football reference up, keep that link up play, a bit of one-two, ticky tacker. that's what we love to see. Kitty Catter, that's our sponsor, Kit Kat. Have a break, <laughs> have a Kit Kat, don't worry about it guys, make sure you buy that. It's uh, our sponsor for the day. Um, Champion going for some aggressive trades with that Counter-Strike. Wonder what patch he's on. Get that Q. Gets a little bit more of an advantage there. And Xanti. It's a terrible name. I think anyone that's got a number in their name should be banned from League of Legends. What do you think about that? Uh, I mean, I don't like, completely agree with that, but it's definitely not I mean, the it's a, easiest it's a, it's a, it's thing a controversial, to do. It's a controversial statement, to be fair. But yeah, I mean, it's. I definitely would imagine that you should, at least when you're playing competitive here, you should aim to have a uh, no no numbers. For me. Xanti as a name, that's someone who doesn't eat Kit Kats normally. True. There's, there's no way. Yeah. It's like, um, do you remember when... So what was your first, like, how did you arrive at the name Flipper? Because I, like, Don Jake is obviously not my first game attack. I was called Astro Tree on Xbox for multiple... Astro Tree? For multiple that's... years on Xbox. That sounds like actually like a pretty good name. Good, pretty good yeah, name. it was a good name for like a 10-year-old. Uh... I mean, a lot of 10-year-olds are called like XX Sniper or something, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think I got my name from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Flip Flop, so I don't know what the English would call them, actually. The... Oh, like Sandals, yeah. Yeah, yeah Sandals. Yeah. Uh, the the Sandals, I used to call them Flippers, so I just went by Flipper. I like it. Good, and then it, it look, that's interesting for you, because are you familiar with the theory of nominative determinism? Uh, no, nope, I'm not. So there's a theory called nominative determinism. It's the idea of like, you know, a lot of people in like the early 1800s. We might have to put a pause on this because Zanti, look at his wave here. It's pushing in a little bit too aggressively. Champion's taking a few bad trades here. You can see uh, Mikkel's wrapping around the side here. Zanti does have the flash, not much mana though. That's gonna, he's going to have to flash away from the stun here. Champion flashes forward but doesn't quite get it. And that's going to be Zanti actually disappearing away from this gank. It's an aggressive trade here from Lofty. 
Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, good trade in mid, and they get the and flash now... out of the Northfight in top lane, so that's very good actually. So now they all they need to do is look for the repeat gang in top. The wave is very bad for this Malphite in top, so I actually could see the Jax TP back, which he is gonna do, and then maybe the Graves looking for a repeat gank here. We'll have to see. Looks towards his bot yes. side, at least for now. Sadly, might, not gonna go for it. That's might actually... Pl might, might play on this wave state. Maybe, maybe cancels. Could be, he's I'm just gonna, gonna base. Yeah, but it's also pretty normal. Graves likes to just go for the full clear, so he's just gonna reset, go into another full clear, and keep up his farm in this game. And back to my silliness I was talking about. So nominative determinism. <laughs> it's the idea, like, you know, in the Victorian times, you'd have a guy called John Smith. And then the idea would be, because your name was that, you would go into, like, being, like, a, a locksmith or, like, a, a smith of, like, you know, weapons and whatnot. So it's the idea that your name, like, bears a sign of... Nominative determinism literally quite... Quite literally means, like, your name determines what you do in life. So ironically, your name... You ended up calling yourself Flipper, and then you became a Nunu player. It's actually, <laughs> like, one of the biggest examples of nominative determinism I've ever seen in League of Legends. Yeah, makes sense. Just flip that snowball around real good, and you'll get some kills. Just flip the game. I mean, that's in essence what Nunu is about, right? You just go bot, don't even look at the wave state, just see what happens. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Have to just have to take take the chance sometimes, you know. See, Champion's actually taking quite a lot of damage from some of these keys. I feel like this is a rather rather oppressive nature of Mal, uh, Malphite when he goes that summon airy. Yeah, I mean, this is... is that summon airy or comet? Yeah, that's comet. He wants that's to just comet, keep. Lad. Poking with this Q, and then when he gets slow, then it basically becomes impossible for the Jax to lane. It's kind of it's it is a counter pick in the early game, and then when you reach mid game, then at some point Jax will take over this lane. But I think this is very interesting because now we will see the Gax come in. But the Lee Sin is ready here with the counter Gax. Ooh, Santi needs to get level needs to get level six here though. I think very important. Champion, what is he doing? He's just sort of standing there. He's able he's... to get out. Rather confusing, rather confusing set of display here. That's... I'm not sure why Champion played it like this, and I'm not sure why he didn't get killed for it. That was actually pretty... Yeah, weird turn of events, but I mean, he lives, nobody dies, they use both ults, and... It looks like they're just gonna recall and go back to lane again. But I mean, this was a good read by Slice, being up there, counter ganking, and he also looks like he's gonna shove out this lane, so the wave will bounce. Also pretty good for the Malphite lane now, so that the wave's coming into him again. Uh, yeah, o overall good for the red side this game, but I will say that it's still just a scaling game for Viperio. They just want to get gold, they just want to get into the later stage of this game, and the later this game goes, I feel like it's just going to favor the red, the blue side more and more. I think it's definitely going to be about this mid game for the red side, and whether or not they are able to actually snowball it for invulnerable. If they can snowball it, then it's gonna end up very positive for them because they can. Ooh, Ooh. that was very. Ooh, close. Hang on, Wazen might fancy his chances here. He knows that Malphite doesn't quite have the ultimate. Has to flash away. I think that was just a bit of fancy footwork. That's like when you do step overs on the football in front of all your friends to try and impress them, and you end up falling over yourself. So rather a bit of Irelia syndrome there. Just went for a few flashy cues when he didn't quite need to. I think he was out after Lofty was well Lofty with his cues. Oh, looks like we have a dead Jax potential. Oh, they're gonna, yeah, they're gonna find, they're gonna find Champion there. That's an ultimate routine job from Slice here. Whether or not Champion can find the stun, get a little bit of space here, going quite aggressively. Oh, trying oh. To find a kill. oh my word! Slice okay. thought he was dead in the water, but he ends up getting dragged into those waves of his own volition, and Champion actually ends up getting the the first blood in that scenario. And in a, in, a, in a scenario, he should never have done so. Yeah, even I thought Champion was dead there and no way he gets a kill trade, but I was definitely reading that wrong. Champion sees an opportunity to get a kill and he does not miss it. He gets the good trade kill, even gets the first blood money here as well. So overall, I mean, what looked like a disaster for Champion ends up being actually very good for him. And it also means now that the entire bot side ends up going to Viper as well. They end up getting the dragon, the crab, and let's see if they're gonna move up to contest this Herald actually now. Does seem like they're moving. 
They do seem to be. You can see that Ermin's made his way up here. Hasn't quite able to leash off any XP to get that level 6, which you quite often like to see around this first Herald. You can see in is Slice on towards Champion. That's Ooh. a big ultimate from the Malphite. Lands on towards 3, though. Nichols had to flash away to counter engage. Out from Ermin. How much can be found here? Four Viperia on the back foot. It's a massive Malkai ult. Here comes the Seraphine in the choke point, but it only lands onto one. Lofty with the Conqueror over the wall now. But it is two kills that is found. 14 Viperio, but it's two on the other side as well. And I believe Slice picked up the Rift Herald as well. Big takeaways are it's an even fight in terms of kills. Rift Herald is picked up, 14 invulnerables, and Lonar is picking up plates in the bot lane. Yeah, definitely ends up being a big win for invulnerable, and they end up being able to get the Herald and they get the even kills. And the Emeth, who is the key factor, did not move. She was just hitting the butter. Ooh. Well, I'm not sure what Slice is doing here. Does he... Oh, um, that was very close. That was very, very close, actually. I think even... I think Mikkel even misplayed this. I don't think it should be that close. And he still ended up losing it. That's uh, intriguing from Slice. Um, we could get Give a replay of that, yeah. We yes, could let's get a replay um, of that. Yes. You see here, opening up here, it's a yeah. massive ultimate from the Malphite. Yeah, you see definitely. as well, Wazen picks up the Rakan ult as well. And from that point onwards, I mean, what really happened? Yeah, I think it definitely just seemed like that the invulnerable side, they had got a good engage with the Malphite. And then as soon as they got that good engage, they actually got overzealous. And they did not notice that the Seraphine was missing for bot lane. So the Seraphine moved in and actually got a very good ult, stopping the Snowball. And they actually end up only getting the return kills because of the Seraphine move. I completely agree with you, that being the case there. Even so, with the Rift Hell being picked up, I actually didn't get to see where it ended up getting placed here. Getting placed been, bot here, been, and they... Yeah, just been placed bot. Seems like they'll maybe potentially even get the entire tower. Ooh, not quite. Okay. That's actually very important that they did, do not get this entire tower already, because it now does not unlock them if to immediately move towards top lane, and got, does keep this gold lead in a very close range, instead of it starting to snowball in favor of invulnerable. And yeah, with those plates as well, and that massive around about 29 CS lead, pardon me, does lead MF in a rather good position. Around about, I want to say, 510 gold up over the Seraphine. Puts them in a good position. It's another component or so, and that can only continue to scale with it being 11 minutes or so. If you were able to, like you say, swap her up to the top side, maybe get some of these plates against the Jacks, would have been even better. But they do manage to not hemorrhage out too heavily in that regard. And it's going to mean that MF can't quite scale as freely as she would want to, but does have that mythic at 11 minutes. And in a minute and 40, that could Ooh. pay dividends. Here's Slice, going to land the Q. Ooh. It's a little very bit more... Te it's, it's very clean, but a little bit more technical than I think it needed to be. Um, yeah, I, I mean... The flash is a, is a bit overkill, but it gets a nice little highlight for himself at least. Yeah, it does make it so that there really has no counter pick. Because Aurelia does a flash, so making this flash kick happen makes it so that Aurelia has no chance of actually flashing after the kick or any of these kinds of shenanigans. So I think it's uh, overall one of those kind of plays you make because you feel the momentum in your favor. So you're yeah. just making sure that no, there's fair. no way that this guy has any way out. And it also means that now Rakan was in mid and Maokai is first to bot again, so now they get the bot lane tower. So it's kind of getting a cascade effect where now they are able to actually snowball both mid and bot lane because of this kill in mid. I completely agree with you. Only a minute or so towards those plates not being available. And with that dragon coming up, you'd imagine they'd want to contest that. So I think that will be the last outing for MF on the map in terms of trying to chase after some of these plates. That will dish up the side lane a bit differently than we would have otherwise anticipated. Um, but in any case, you can see Waves and back to business as usual, constantly pushing in this Waves here. It has Mikkel and Ermin mm. in tandem in response now. He does miss here, but it's going to be a routine kill here. It's That's quite like the previous exchange. You see him constantly aggressively trading, but this time he did have backup. Yeah, something we didn't even get to touch on is that the dragon is spawning almost in only 20... 10 seconds now, so this kill in mid means so much because it basically secures the second dragon for Viperio and it, again, it, every time it looks like Invulnerable is taking over this game and they're about to make sure that they can snowball, Viperio just says nope and then they kill someone and they get a very important neutral on the map. So I would say it's both teams are kind of going head to head right now and they're looking very even in how this game is shaping up to be. Yeah, completely with you. There, you can see Wazen. Just needs a bit of team support behind him sometimes to play as aggressive as he'd, li as he'd like. 
he's got that jungler hovering. I think that is going to be the key for some of his mid lane play in terms of opening up the map. As now plates do finally drop in this game. Champion's getting zoned a little way, a bit away from this top lane turret. But this is the point in which in the game, we started to talk about this mid game and how the Jax comes online. The matchup starts to come a bit in the favor. Malphite does have those tabby and that frozen heart, which I think does make it a little bit more difficult for Jax to get these nice aggressive trades off. But are we starting to reach that tipping point in which Jax can really start to be online in the side lane? Uh, we are we are looking towards like the two. Actually, no, we are looking towards the three to four items on Jax before he actually starts taking. Okay, over three to four game. items. Okay, bit bit later than I thought then. Yeah, because currently. Jax is not really able to kill the Malphite fast enough compared to how much poke he's taking from the Qs. And he isn't high enough level to just like just out sustain as well. So currently Malphite is a bit too tanky for the Jax to deal with him. But over time when you get some lifesteal and then when you get some more HP, he's gonna just, as I said, run over this lane when he gets these three items. But it does seem like they're setting up for a potential play on the top side with the Herald spawning. Indeed, it would seem that they are. Second Herald of the game would allow them to potentially crack this mid lane turret. As we spoke before, it would be a major focal point for Team Viperia if they could do so. Mikkel has started it up. There's a slight lead. Has that Umbral Glaive has rushed it. Got the tabbies as well. They've teleported in, so they are committing multiple numbers. You can see the rest of Viperia have been somewhat flummoxed from the choke as the Phalanx of Invulnerables moves forward aggressively. Trade in the top side between the Malphite and the Jax. Lofty tries to go in, has the Rakan ultimate. Quite lands on towards Mikkel. Oh. This is the counter engage they were looking for. It's a big Seraphine all over the wall here. Trade Malphite for Grave so far. MF is going to take out Champion. Here comes Lofty in though. Didn't quite find it, but the Ignite from Marcuse is going to take out. I believe that was Champion off to the side there. Slice is in as well with the Gore Drinker, but not able to quite do too much. Can he find it? Yes, he can. And for the most part, Viperia are absolutely wiped. That I did not expect this fight to go like this, but it ends up being heavily in favor of Invulnerable, and they end up taking the fight very handily, and they will get the Herald as well. And we are going to head into a replay here as well. But here, here we see actually a uh, we see the start of the the Herald from Viperio, and then we see this Jax going immediately onto this Malphite, and Malphite gets out here after he gets the speed up, but then they see an opening where they can actually engage with the Malphite, so we see the Flash ult, and it's actually, it ends up being very good for Invulnerable after this engage. Uh, in the end, it's uh, 3k gold, it almost now 2.5k for the Invulnerable side, and it looks like it's gonna be a very good snowball in, in the start of it here right now. I think it is definitely a big lead and I think the only way that I see right now that Viper gets back into it is by playing on these side lanes. They want to just put this Rakan either towards top or bot and try to get picks, try to get some gold back into your pockets to make sure you're actually able to still win this game. If I... Oh yeah, I guess I go. No, no, I was just, you know, interjecting. I don't have anything to say. I'm just agreeing with you. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. I think... Yeah, uh, it makes you sound way more smart if, like, the other person agrees with you, you know? That's for sure true. <laughs> I think uh, if I'm looking at what's next for Viperial, Drake is in one minute, you have two. And I would almost say that you're giving the next couple of Drakes. So what I want to see is this Graves, when he resets here, go towards top side. Try to see if they can make a cross map when this Drake is spawning and try to see if they can get some gold back into the pockets. So they can maybe try to see if they can aim for this top tower and maybe even another tower or pick on a kill. But currently it does seem like it can be a contest still because Graves is running down mid lane. So maybe we're going to see another big fight around this Drake. Would be third dragon in the game for Viperio, allow them to shore up their options at least towards the soul. They're trailing slightly in gold from the previous exchange, but still quite strong on multiple members and they're able to operate in that choke. They need to be very careful about the Silas and the Malphite. They've sort of got the both both sides of that coin. You, you quite often, you know, you see that Malphite get picked. You're worried about the Silas counter pick. It's rare that you see so, so both of them coming to play in cohesion together but there's so much kind of danger offered by this invulnerable roster at the moment in terms of picking up these key ultimates from team viperio it's, it's kind of the, this is that point of contention isn't it for that silas pick you, you sort of make the team enemy team's main points of strength their weakness don't you yeah i do i will say i really loved what i just saw from viperio they 
re recognized that they are not in a position to contest this Drake. They immediately went into the top side, put down Vision into the enemy jungle, and they took the top lane tower, which means now that they, they got a big gold injection into the Jax, trying to snowball him a bit and make it so that he reached this breakpoint where he can actually beat the Malphite in the side lane. And that is the case, for sure. They did give up that dragon. They're not too fussed about it. They're not quite as assured in playing for that win condition as they would have liked to have been. But, you know, they do get something in response to it. Enable that Jax, like you said, which is going to pay dividends later into the game, you feel. Is the lack of range a concern for this Viperio team? Uh, if they're going to play teamfights, I think it can be very dangerous against this MF. I think the best way for Viperio to end up utilizing the way their comp is drafted is having this Rakan on a flank and getting on top of this MF because I don't know I don't see any way that Vapero actually can reach MF unless she makes a misstep or if this Rakan gets a very good flank and they're able to just catch her out of nowhere. So from my point of view that because they have very limited range and because they are not able to actually reach the backline that easily, I would like to just see them avoid teamfights at all costs because this front to back that Invulnerable has drafted is very good in teamfights and if it ends up being forced into these teamfights, I see them having a very favorable matchup against the Vaperio side. I think one thing that they can definitely benefit from is that they have, you know, at least Invulnerables, a benefit for Viperia is Invulnerables has drafted one of the worst champions in the game which is Lee Sin this, oh. champion, doesn't, this, champion, doesn't, this champion doesn't do anything you know okay this you think it's not good do you think it's good yeah I think it I think it can be extremely good if if it's a very good Lee Sin player which I think Slice is quite a good Lee Sin player it can it can quite easily make good picks if you're able to get the kicks off and you're able to Ooh, hello read. from Wazen. This might little be, be a little bit overzealous here. He does have quite a healing from the Conqueror. Ultimate comes down. Can he find it under the turret? Yes, he can. Well, it looked dangerous for a second or so. It's a good pick in this island, but whether or not Invulnerables can respond on towards the Baron, we'll have to see. They're chiming multiple recalls, but it doesn't seem to be the case. This is exactly what I've been talking about, that I want to see from Viperio, we want to see them make plays on the sideline, and they keep doing that. So I'm just, I'm, I just want to see them keep doing this, keep making plays on the side, and keep creating pressure, keep taking down these towers, keep just making plays that involves the Jax or the Aurelia, and they do that right now. And that has also made sure that the gold lead now is only around 1,000 gold. So so far, I think it, I'll give them a thumbs up and say keep doing what you're doing. And if I'm looking at invulnerable, I want them to for sure, make sure that their side are playing more safe and create a strong side. So what I mean by creating a strong side is that once you put a member or what, once you identify what objective you're going to play for, for example, let's say they want to play for this dragon in two minutes, they want to put most members and vision towards the Nullfight now. And once they have put down this vision towards the Nullfight, he can now play aggressive. But that also means that this Silas in the top lane cannot just walk up and play aggressive with no vision. Otherwise, he can run into the 3v1 scenario without having any backup. I think that's a very fair point. I think it's fair to say that I'm not so sure about how this kind of jungle AD carry swap has worked out. I feel like the game is still very much to play for, but... In terms of like an actual intrinsic benefit that it's offered, I can't really see. I think you look towards like roster swaps. I look at like CLG EU in like season three, season two, for example, where they would pull out these crazy roster swaps. And that was owing to sort of champion pool. You know, multiple members of them could play. Anivia, for example, they had kind of weird meta strategies they would pull out. I can't see anything that would have gone differently than if they'd just been playing the other the other's champions this game. So I, I, I guess I'd be intrigued, at least at post-mortem of this game, to ask them a bit more of a reasoning as to why that is the case. Yeah, for sure. I'm also very interested in knowing why it is they ended up swapping. So far, I think it's... I mean, I wouldn't say that the uh, Miguel or Mutra has done bad on their champions. They've done no, good. No, no, I just... Doing not good not enough game, so. to, like... Not enough for me to be like, why, oh, that's why they've done it. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure, for sure. There's th definitely still some questions you want to know and, like, oh, why did you... Do this but i think the for me it seems like ermin and Miguel they have very good synergy as you pointed out earlier today and yeah that's probably what i'm leaning towards might be the answer but we for sure should ask and see why it is they ended up making this call 
I also I, I do like I do like the Umbral Glaive on the Graves, but for me, when you're going for this sort of build with the Gordrinker, which presumably you'd, you'd imagine he's going to go for stuff like the potentially the Black Cleaver, more some of these more kind of bruiser bruiser off tank kind of build. I don't like the Umbral Glaive with that. I feel like it just delays too much. It doesn't synergize necessarily that well with those items. I think those items cost so much gold to which you want to just get them. You want to get that three item spike and really play around that. I, I'm not a massive fan of the way he's uh, itemizing now. You look over to the other side in response. Um, they've got similar margins of profit and you can see that Lee Sin's got that Black Cleaver already. I think if that was the Graves, he'd actually be a lot more useful than the Lee Sin in response. I think he probably still is in some ways, but definitely uh, delaying his spike, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I the reason why you go... I played quite a bit of Grace and Soul here recently and the reason why you go the Umbral earlier is uh, the Graves kit is very much damage heavy on front load so if you buy some lethality and you're trying to burst like let's say he's trying to burst the mf this game it can be good and it can be what breaks him to kill him uh but for sure when looking at a lot of armor stacking champions umbral grave is usually not what i would deem very good it's basically just saying oh you want some vision control so let's just buy this item that can make it so we can have a little bit more vision control but yeah, I I mean, i'm looking i'm looking at four four champions that potentially would build armor this game I mean, yeah. should, three, three of which should and so, armor nobody's sitting on the 555 armor so definitely will not do a lot against them <laughs> Yeah, not not a, not a massive fan of that. As as, as Phil is like as well, when you've got your Aurelia and your Jax as well, you want to be getting towards that Black Cleaver as, as quick as possible as well. I think especially for Jax, you want to play with that 2v2 as well. And I think so much of this game is about leaving Seraphine on the island playing towards that top side as well. I think it would have been good to see, but you know, I'm picking at straws here. I'm being nitpicker. You know, I play Nuno, I can't play the game, so I have to look at builds and stuff. For sure, for sure. I think... Uh... It's definitely going to be interesting now, because now both teams have two Drakes. I would see maybe if they're going to go for a potential 5v5 on the next Drake. I, it could be an e easy option to even still give the next Drake, but then I, w I would hope that they're going to either dive or try to take one of these bottom top turrets, because they need to start getting closer to the base with the step pushers. I think if they give this next trick, it could be an indication that they might even just give soul. But I am really looking towards if they are going to be able to get more out of these silence now. Because it's getting closer and closer to the soul point. And once the team has soul, then it's going to be Elder. And then it's going to be very hard to contest these objectives at that point. But I think it's going to be very clear well, how this game is going to be played out once we see what the each side is going to do on this next neutral, which is going to be the Drake, I believe. You can see so much of what Invulnerables is trying to do is just exert four members on the map at one time and play this is kind of rolling death ball with the Malphite. You engage from such a... so far away. Speaking about engaging from far away, it's a heavy trade from Wazen on towards Lofty. It takes about about one third of his HP, even half with the tick towards the end there. And you can see Ermin constantly playing towards this Aurelia in the side lane. Has Flash available, might look for a Flash here over the wall any second now. Not quite going to do it. It takes a few seconds to decide. Zonya's is going to dodge out from the Rakan quickness and the Aurelia ultimate. Ermin's taking quite a lot of damage out under the turret and Lofty might have just found a 1v2. Very, very bad sort of anticipation and not, not quite taking... I'm trying to find the word here, but it's, it's too much uh, hesitation there is the word I'm looking for from yeah. Ermin and Wazen. Ultimate Definitely. goes wide from the Aurelia and the quickness as well times out. Just needed to go there. You can't hesitate in a scenario like that. You just got to press go button and he eventually does and ends up paying absolutely horrible, hor puts him a horrible deficit. They just get the Baron, 300 gold shot down on the MF. He's around 3k or so, 2.5k up in the lead. They're going to be able to get this Dragon as well with no qualms. You feel as if now the game very much in Invulnerable's control. For sure. I think it's also very well played by Lofty. He manages to Sanyas the Rakan ult and it makes it so that he doesn't get chained to see them potentially killed so it's very very well played by the silas here and obviously it's unfortunate that they're not able to pull the trigger as you said fast enough and just go in hard so he doesn't have that chance to react but sometimes you do get upplayed oh and we have another fight potentially here in the side you can see zanti lands an ultimate on towards two here slip S slice over the wall here slip, swing and a miss here seraphine all out in response from lofty doesn't land onto too many, but the fights continue to go awry for Viperio. 
as they have become the snake that eats itself, sown the seeds of their own demise. Khan constantly two deaths back to back in the last minute or so. They're going to base now, look towards that cloud dragon, shore up their options, move even more movement speed to potentially move over the grieving corpses of what Viperu are. Dead men walking at the moment, 4k down, the game not going in their favor in recent minutes. Yeah, they definitely have to slow down in the way that they are taking place. It looks like it looked like after they got this misplay bot, they were just immediately looking for the next play, and it it looks like they're just gonna go immediately for the next play, which I really dislike. I think they should take a breather, but it looks like we're gonna have another fight here. Gonna be another fight. They might not have learned the lesson. His lofty on towards Mutra. He's not getting taken down any second now. Flashes away from the exchanges. A big fight. Champion lands a stun on towards two, but taking so much damage from the UF. It's a big bullet time on towards three. And that might just be the final nail in the proverbial coffin. As Viper, you spoke about not stepping up to the batter's plate for this final play. They continue to bang their head against the wall, and despite the bruises that may come away from it, they do not learn their lesson like children with fingers on the stove or cavemen being proverbially hunted, they continue to make the same mistakes. They do not learn from the sins of their forefathers and they will be getting battered and bruised in the oncoming exchange as four members do drop, mill tier two taken, and they're gonna be looking towards the inhibitor now. Yeah, it definitely looked like they kind of lost their composure. They lost the fight in the bottling where they got outplayed by the Silas and then after that they kind of lost their head and they just took fight after fight, which did not work out for them at all. Sad to see, but Overall, I think the early game did go fine for Viperio. Oh, it, the game actually is not over yet. Okay, so if we're looking at Viperio's side here, it's about kind of com coming down and just letting Invulnerable try to make plays and then you trying to look for the outplay instead of being vice versa. And when you're looking at Invulnerable, now you have two inhibs down. Just group butt, try to get that third and final inhibitor together and see if you can finish this game. Absolutely. We're going to a replay now, having a look at what happened in this fight here. Yeah, the important to note is even off screen here, you can see Mutra just has to flash away from the exchange. They don't have that Seraphino in to play around the corridor. Champion takes so much damage. This is your sort of prolific eponymous carry that we were looking towards. It's a lovely kick from Slice actually that I didn't even notice in the initial fight that kicks Mikkel into the bullet time here. And you know, fair enough, you had a bit of slander towards the champion earlier. I was I was talking of my Lee Sin Hey. He's done enough this game in terms of shoring up, you know, establishing himself as a as a as someone who deserves to have played or at least justified the Lee Sim pick here, constantly finding these kicks. Although he did come up to a bit of a misplay earlier against the Mikkel that ended up him dying in the 1v1. One one. Oh, Viperio might have set up a, a deep play play here. Yeah, it looks like they're going to be on a good flank. It looks like they're going to come from behind and see if they can find this MF because... If they're gonna win the fight, it's gonna be on the back of killing this MF immediately and not letting her get another amazing ult like she's had in the previous MF team fight. MF has all summoners and GA. They're playing in the vision rather well here. Gonna make their way into this bush here. Ways and goes in, they found it. Cleanse and flash away from Lonar. He's avoided the initial damage. How much can he do? Goes into GA here. How much healing can be garnered from the Seraphine? That's Ermin going down. That's the bullet time coming down onto Wards. They killed MF, but at what cost? As invulnerables invulnerably damage and protrude themselves on towards the crucifix of Viperio. They tried to find a rather sneaky play but sneak through the dusk, mm -hmm. and sometimes you shall not find much more than a lonely wandering knight. Champion versus Slice here. Slice goes into the GA, but it is going to be Champion's base that is continually getting taken out here. Ace for Ace for Invulnerables, as they prove the base of Viperio to be very vulnerable. It's going to be a stopwatch in the base. BM from Xanti, and Invulnerables move their way up to 2-2, two two, saving themselves in the race for playoffs. Very good game by Invulnerable. They got the outplay in bot lane by the Silas, and since that point, they just snowballed and they kept winning fight after fight. Even though it was the Viper side that was starting the fight, it didn't mean anything. They just outplayed, and when they got the chance of that Drake to stamp their feet and take complete control of the game, they took it, and we saw an amazing kick from Slice. He kicked straight into the bullet time, knocking up into the Malphite ult, complete domination from, from them.
Absolutely. And uh, we talked about, was it a concern in terms of the range? They didn't have it available to them. Was that going to be a kind of a concern, a grievance going forward? And it continued to be so. Your counter to that, me saying that, was they need to not play towards the team fights. They need to enable themselves in the side lane. But that never ended up being a, a, a sort of something they went towards. Getting the jacks online, able to play in that side lane was so difficult because getting themselves out on the map and playing the map, stay away from these neutrals, they just didn't have the time. You know, you saw time and time again the, the, the two, that two-dragon window where they were trying to trade it for the top lane tower. It worked once, but Invulnerables was wiser to that play the next time. They sent members up. And although Ermin continued to look for these plays with Wazen, they never ended up being able to break that kind of stone wall, break forwards the defence. It's what they needed to do. You can see that 1v2 play in the bottom lane where Ermin unfortunately dies. I really felt like that was the beginning of the end for me because you weren't able to enable that side lane from that point onwards. And if you play into this composition, especially with some of the itemization that I was seeing, you're just not going to win in a straight up 5v5. It's just so much more tank stats, so much more durability. And they, 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 hung, to, they hung on to the game perfectly. Absolutely true. I could not agree more. Definitely seemed like they had uh, some troubles with how they were actually meant to function in the 1-3-1. One, one, and they were not able to get the snowball rolling. And once they got one out play on the, the invulnerable side, it just snowballed out of nowhere. And they just took over the game and they just ended up winning. And it was a clean win. I can't really say much fault on them. They just got the lead and they just took it all the way through and they won. I don't think there's and much that can be said beyond that. We do have, reportedly, we've got Slice, the man of the hour, the man who made Lee Sin look like a good champion. We've got him coming in for an interview. I'm sure you'll have some questions for him. I yeah. certainly do as well. But, you know, talk about the stakes of the group now. This puts this puts um, Viperio out at one and three behind a Team Nariki that are now three and one, I believe, a Team Singularity that are two and two, and a Team Viperio that are two and two now. Is it fair to say, I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but this definitely puts Viperio in quite... Um, dwindling odds. I think every game has to be a win from this point onwards if they want to get towards the group stage. For sure. They need to win the rest uh, of their games. Get towards the playoff stage, sorry. Yeah, they need to win the rest of their games and then probably going to hang on a tiebreaker potentially at the end of the day if they do end up winning those games. And it's a shame because I look at some of their players, I think in terms of just... You know, nameplates on. You look at this roster, you look at some of the names on it. I look at Champion, Waze and Ermin, all very established players within the Telia structure a few years ago. I can't necessarily say that to be the case for Invulnerables. No flame for them. You know, every every you know, every player, you know, sometimes you see players come through. But you know, if I talk about just pure kind of bias of just what I know and the knowledge that is available to me, you'd expect this Viperio roster to operate a lot better. Just um but unfortunately just don't have the cohesion. I feel like a lot of the time some of the way that they wanted to play is not necessarily enabled by the other members. I look towards, for example, Wazen, the amount of aggression he had in this mid lane. I feel like he's got a support hovering him one or two more times. He's got a jungler. Maybe those plays go a little bit better. I think the map play was a lot better when it came into playing towards the side lane, but that's a lot more binary. I think in terms of actually playing in a, as a team in these early stages, um, not really there for me from Viperio. They don't look like a team that's played together for too long. Yeah, I definitely agree. It seems like their team cohesion just did not gel that good with this game. Uh, for me, it definitely is about looking at what they need to fix for these next two games that makes them able to play. Maybe it's about picking a easy to execute team fight comp. Maybe it's about going all in on maybe one single split pusher and then have very good wave clear on the other people. But I definitely think that this comp did not work out for them and they need to find a solution that can actually work for them for the future games if they want to make it out of this group. Okay, cool. I do believe we've got Slice in the Discord, ready to go for an interview. I don't know if he's going to be coming for Cam. We shall have to see. Maybe he's on a more defensive position, not playing that central attacking midfielder. Um, producer, can we get an update? What's going on with that? No camera. We're ready for him at any time. Do drag him in. Hello. Hello, and welcome to the Rate Gaming Denmark channel, Mr. Slice. Thanks. Slice it how you like it. Slice of life. You definitely <laughs> brought your team into a position of life this game, giving them a lifeline towards your playoff streams. How do you feel, sir, with your lease-in performance? I mean, like, I saw Malarang play it yesterday, and I'm like, I'm playing it today. I'm playing it today. If Malarang can do it, I can do it. Incredible. It's as easy as that. That's I like incredible the logic. Incredible I... logic from you. We were having a little bit of a debate because I hate Lee Sin as a champion. For me, it's a very <laughs> do-nothing champion. 
Um, but you know, you found these angles, and we were talking about. I think one of the things that Flipper brought up on the broadcast was how you you play these champions. You better find those engages, but be it the flash kicks, be it the ward hops, be it the kind of diving onto the back line. Um, for you as a player, you obviously found these pivotal moments. What is the feeling after finding them and turning the tide of the fight? I can imagine, for example, when you found the kick onto Mikkel on the Graves, ulting him into the bullet time, or kicking people into the Malphite ult, really enabling your composition to play. What is that feeling like when it all comes together? I mean, like, the champion is so fun because you have so many dash and that dashes and shit. Like, you can just cue the back lane, you have ward jump, you have kick flash, you have, like, everything. So... It, the champ can enable you as a player so much to do so good mechanically plays and carry your team with it. Like, if they have a backline and you're playing Lee Sin, no matter what ba backline champion they're playing, you can always get on them somehow. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. think the champ is really good. And I guess th this comp, like, they have four melee champs kind of low range and one by, like, Seraphine. Then it's, I always, Seraphine has no mobility. I always get on her somehow. So... Yeah. Uh, I was I was wondering how you guys felt how you had to deal with the sideline pressure that the Vipiro side had this game. So they had the Aurelia and they had the Jax. And it seemed like you guys were kind of struggling in the first half of the game where how you were going to deal with it. Did you did you feel like you found an adequate uh, answer to the split push? Yeah, I mean, like, Silas couldn't obviously, like, really contest waves on side against Irelia or Jax. So we just had to sit under tier 2 bot tower and they did, then they tried to dive him and he just outplayed them, killed him and we get free Nasher. So it's like, uh, they they entered it. Yeah, okay. Can you, can uh, you explain Can you explain to me what the, the German Khan means? <laughs> German Khan, it's the upcoming number one, number one ranked top laner. You will see him in words very soon. Very soon. Well, okay. By very soon, you mean next year? Yeah, yeah. Because current, um, right. unless he's unless he's subbing in for some team. Yeah, but he so. might sub in the finals. Who knows? Like, who knows what's coming? <laughs> he, sp he speaks Korean or Chinese, or? Yeah, he speaks both, all languages, all the he Asian speaks... languages. He speaks all the Asian languages. Yes, sir. Can you? Have you got any other interesting facts about him? I mean, he's also known as the Pope, the German Pope. The German Pope. Yeah. Nice. It's just yeah. What's he had a bit, He did have. He did have a bit of performance on the Malphite. Is there any other champions you think he's? What champion are you most excited for German Khan to show off? Vein. Have you seen his vein? No, I've not seen. I've not oh, seen his vein. Oh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa! I'm, exci I'm excited. I'm excited. Every single top Do we have to vein? pull it up? <laughs> I, I'll have no, a talk to him. Yeah. Have a talk to him. Yes. I mean, his vein, like, and the build. Oh. Oof, 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 oof. It's you too spicy for this tournament. Is it? Is it the Riftmaker lawnmower build? <laughs> yes. It might be. It might be. I might have leaked. I might have leaked. Delete the vod. Delete the vod. But anyway, uh, delete the vod. Um. Anyway, you go and talk to him. It's been lovely talking to you. We hope you and um, wish you the best of luck in your in the next games. Thank you. A few you. more games to decide whether or not you make it out of playoffs. Playing under the Invulnerables banner. We'll be looking towards. We're looking forward to seeing you play the rest of the day. Um. Is there anything else you'd like to shout out before we leave you? Uh, it's lost this season, guys. It's lost this season. Thanks for me. Peace. Bye. See you after Bye. next week. See you. Bye. See you. Peace. All right, cool. Um, we're going to be heading into a break. I believe our next game of the day is... God, remind me. It's uh, Niriki Viperio, I believe, is the next game. Um, but we're going to be going to a break. Don't go anywhere. If you go anywhere, I'm going to find you. And that's not a threat in terms of, like, I'm going to do anything. But what I'm going to do is, if you go anywhere, I'm going to find you, and I'm just going to look at you, like, passively, aggressively. And in a way of, like, where have you, what do you think you're doing, mate? Like, what, what, what are you playing at? Um, I'm sure Flipper will do something similar as well. Yeah, in any sure. case, we're, we're going to be going somewhere. Nowhere is the answer. And don't go anywhere either. Bye-bye. <laughs>